The creature climbed the side of the car as we rode. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I'm going to tell you a story that happened recently to a friend of mine that you're not going to believe. Then, I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me personally a bit further back that should explain why I do believe the story my friend told me. And both stories have to do with a North American upright walking canid, or a dogman, present in upstate New York of all places. Now, those of you who are interested in cryptids already know that portions of upstate New York are famous for their sightings of a certain other cryptid, with Whitehall even making it illegal to end the lives of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Yet it's not too far from Whitehall to where this Dogman story took place. Both Dogman stories I'm about to tell you, in fact. This first one happened to a friend of mine that we can call Shelly just because that name popped into my head. Now, I don't remember exactly what day or night she said this happened, but it was recent. Maybe it was one of our recent snowy days here in New York State that would explain a lot. Shelley took the Metro North Harlem Line commuter train north from Grand Central Station in Manhattan, heading upstate to visit relatives. The train ran fine until they got to White Plains, I think, or North White Plains. Then it just sat there with the doors open for minutes until the train started getting really cold inside. So Shelley was sitting there waiting for the train to do something and eventually they made an announcement over the loudspeaker. This train was going direct from White Plains or North White Plains to Chappaqua, skipping over Valhalla, Hawthorne, and Pleasantville. People who wanted those stations should take this to Chappaqua and then take the local going back south from there. My friend, she's continuing on north of these stations, so she stayed in her seat and she continued to wait until the train finally closed its doors and then off they go. So, after some time, not having any local stations to stop at, the train began to pick up some speed. They were really flying down that track, going faster than Shelley said she'd ever gone on that rail line. That was when she noticed something out of the corner of her eye in the window across the train. Someone was out there, clinging sideways to the outside of the car, turning her full attention on what she was seeing. Shelley looked with both eyes wide open, and she said she saw a guy clinging to the train car exterior who had pectoral muscles from the cover of a vintage romance novel. That was how she put it. He looked like a hero from a romance novel, except that he had a monster head on top of his massive, powerful shoulders. That was how she described it, a monster head. She never said canine. She never said it looked like a wolf. She said it was a muscle man body from a romance novel with a monster head on top and it was crawling along and clinging to the outside of the train as it sped along at greater and greater speeds in bad cold weather. For her to have first not seen it and then noticed it, her assumption was that the creature was crawling along outside from the rear of the train toward the front for whatever reason, it appeared to be enduring great difficulty out there, and Shelley said there was more than one time when she was convinced the thing was going to lose its grip and go flying off into the woods next to the rail line. As terrifying as the creature man was, Shelley found herself worried that he might be about to lose his life at any second. I asked her if she could be more descriptive about the face, and she grew annoyed with me. Shelley felt insulted that I was saying she hadn't used enough detail. Why do you want to harp on the ugliness of the world, she asked me at one point, and I sort of wonder if she was spending so much time staring at his huge pectoral muscles and his broad shoulders that she neglected to take notice of his facial features at all. Nevertheless, I was able to eventually drag out of her that the man did not have a mouth or a nose like that of a human being. His nose was made of black leather, she said, and she seemed to indicate that he had an elongated mouth, more like an animal than like a human. His face was black, 
but she meant literally black, like a black leather jacket is how she put it, and it had dark hair or fur growing out the sides and the top of that black leather face. The ears were pointed, she told me, as she thought back on it. Like an elf, I asked, picturing the ears on the side of the head as we have them. More like a fox, she said as I watched her trying to visualize her memories. The ears were up on top of the head. So the short version of it is that this was a wild animal that resembled a human, but most likely had a far advanced sense of smell and hearing. I asked about its legs, but Shelley told me she only noticed it as it seemed to be climbing sideways up from the rear of the train. She saw its head, chest, belly, and arms, but before she saw any more than that, the idea finally came to her that she should probably alert someone working the train as to what was going on. Shelley stood up just as the announcement came that they were pulling into Chappaqua Station. I'm not sure if her memories of this point in the story are confused, or if I just did not understand what she was saying when she told me this over the phone. But I know that by the time the train had stopped and she had alerted the attention of one of the men working on the train to the situation, the dogman was no longer there. He very well may have been long gone. Now the train line over there parallels the Sawmill River Parkway and Chappaqua itself is home to some very rich and powerful individuals. It seems an unlikely stop for the dogman to get off at. But on the other hand, it's not that far from there to the hard scrabble wilderness area. And if there were ever a cryptid I would describe as hard scrabble, it would be the dogman. Maybe he was just taking the train home to the hard scrabble. Now, the reason I believe Shelley's story, and the reason I think she told me about it in the first place, is that I have had my own upstate New York dogman experience. And in fact, Mine did not happen very far away from what happened to Shelley. It didn't happen in the hard scrabble wilderness area, though. It happened in the opposite direction. About a two-hour walk from the train station there, just barely outside of Chappaqua itself, is a lovely little park and wilderness area called Wampus Pond Park. I've always loved that park because since I was a kid, I thought it was named after the Wampus Cat which is an American mythological monster. In one version, it has six legs, four to run on, and two to fight with. In other versions, it's a kind of a humanoid cat, like a cat version of Dogman. It's been used and changed around in so many different pop culture items and franchises, from Harry Potter to a brand of beer, that you can find a million different versions of the Wampus Cat. I was actually sad to learn that the park and pond are not in fact named after that cryptid. They are named after a Native American who sold the area to the Europeans. His name was Wampus, and it turns out his name translates to mean, no, not a six-legged cat, but instead, an opossum. So in all the literature I've ever read about the Wampus cat, I never ever read anyone writing that the word wampus comes from a Native American word for possums. Wampus cat means possum cat. How many students of cryptozoology even knew that? I only found out by chance myself. So, now this was around 2011 or 2012, and I still thought that wampus pond was named after a cryptozoological monster. It still had an air of mystery for me personally. I was there at sundown, and as beautiful as it was, I wanted to get on the road before it got too dark. I was packing my stuff up, and I thought I heard someone with asthma in the area. I looked around, thinking someone needed my help, maybe some old man or something. I was somewhat surprised to see that everyone had already left, and that I was the last person there. I tell you, that sent a shiver through me that took its time before it shivered itself out. I went from the peace of enjoying a sunset to literally fearing for my life in under 10 seconds, and it was not a comfortable feeling. 
I packed up my backpack quickly, carrying a few things that it would have taken too much time to fold up and pack. I visualized my car in my mind, and each time I heard a sound or saw a flash of something that told me someone else was there with me, I would once again visualize my car and visualize the quickest path to it. It was hard staying focused, but it gave me an excuse to not give in, to panic. Each time I would hear or see further evidence that I was, in fact, in danger, I would just refocus and force myself to breathe normally. Take deep, slow, full breaths as though you are relaxed, and maybe you can trick your body out of panicking for a little while longer. That was basically my battle plan. And then, as I literally had my car in literal sight, my beautiful, perfect little lifesaver of a car, the figure who had been creeping around, spying on me, made itself known. It didn't show itself for long, but it did so in a spectacular enough and loud enough way that there could be no doubt that it had all actually happened. I knew I hadn't imagined it. I know this really happened. And what really happened was this. A man with legs like a fawn out of ancient mythology ran out of the woods to my right and sprinted in front of me toward my left, knocking over a garbage can and then disappearing into the bushes. It was a very hairy man, but it was for the most part shaped more like a human than like a beast. It had a torso like a human, for instance. It had arms. It seemed to have hands. Imagine a muscular athlete with abnormally thick body hair, but the legs were like those of an animal, and the beast man ran with both grace and speed, unreachable by a human. Its head, similarly, was more of an animal head than a human. I did not see the face change expression, so I cannot say for certainty that it might not have been an elaborate mask. But it was either the head of a canine or else a very beautiful Halloween mask meant to portray a wolf or a feral dog. The creature was, as I said, running diagonally toward me and to my left. That instinctively sent me to my right and forward, which was the direction my car was parked in. The dogman was headed away from my vehicle, which was all the more reason for me to run toward it at top speed. I was so pumped with adrenaline in that moment, I don't think I had much choice in the matter anyway. I ran to my car, and I drove the heck on out of there. This didn't happen out in the Ozarks or wherever either. This happened in Armonk, New York. I don't think we've got many hillbillies around here. This is not a place to mess around with. 75% of the locals are lawyers, and the rest are politicians. It's the last place in the world you'd expect to find a prehistoric dog-headed caveman. But there you have it. And so, this is why I believe my friend's story, which happened a 20-minute drive away. I took her at her literal word when she told me... <laughs> The creature climbed the side of the car as we rode. Bigfoot and the Dogman and the Yeti from the Himalayas would like to thank today's executive producer, Zachariah. Please join us in thanking Zachariah Kittle for making this episode possible. In exchange, he gets to see our weekly Sunday Uncensored Scary Dogman stories, which are all far too wild to tell on this channel. You can also join at higher levels for bigger perks. And now here is international TV spokes mongrel Henry Lee Dogman to fill you in on the rest of the deets. Hank? Thanks for watching till the end. If you liked what you saw, please consider clicking like on the video or sharing it with your friends and family that you think might also be interested. If you would like to see more of our work, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube will alert you when we put out a new video. To become a channel member and gain access to our special perks, you can click that join link under each of our videos. 
Another option is to join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. You can join for as little as 99 cents on YouTube or a buck 50 at peterbernard.com and that gains you access to our weekly secret uncensored episodes. If you'd like to see our 21 hours of archives of uncensored dogman stories, then please join at the $3 level or above. To get to watch our shows in advance of the public, please join at our $10 level. That gets you all the perks. If you join our channel memberships, you need to check our community page here on YouTube in order to get the links to the secret videos and other perks. If you're in the PayPal Subscribers Club, Peter will email you all the news and links himself. Once joining the PayPal Club, which is Peter's homemade club, please give him a chance to see that you've joined and to compose you a personal welcome email, as none of that is automated. But whichever you join, we'll name you an executive producer for the next available episode. Do you have a scary experience that you'd like to share with us? You can email us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or call our Scary Stories voicemail hotline at 804-LA-SCARY. That's 804-537-2279. It's a Google voicemail box, so that means it keeps cutting off after every three minutes. If your story is longer than that, Please keep calling back, and we can piece it together on our end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back for more. Scary Story.